Hello everyone, welcome back to the updated beginner's guide to Hunters. This is going to be the Joust episode. But before we go into the Joust episode, I wanted to share with you the changes to Neath's build that I've created specifically for Joust. Basically, I'm just adding at this point another layer on my god build, in addition to what I built in Arena. In this particular case, specifically, this is crit items. Also, Death's Toll for when I want to go non-crit, auto-attack based. Now, why crit items? Well, because Joust is a 3v3, and in fact the only regular game mode that isn't 5v5, this means that you are faced with a lot less serious competition. There's fewer enemies to deal with. There's less incoming damage. As a result, crit items in the right situation can be incredibly dominating in Joust for that reason. Because, of course, as we all know, crit items are really difficult to deal with in 1v1 scenarios, but why is that? Well, very specifically, critical hits increase the damage of the auto attack that is critting by a percentage. I, it's 25 or 30 percent, specifically. Because that percentage increase is enhancing the auto attack, it remains a regular auto attack, the extra added damage is part of that auto attack, and that means any lifesteal you have is also going to affect that crit. So. The bigger your crit, the more you heal off of the, with the lifesteal. As a result, if you build properly, the combination of the increased damage from crits and the lifesteal is really going to create a huge disparity between your damage output and your received damage. Right? The problem, really, with crits is two. There's two issues with crit builds. The first one is that they can take quite a bit of an investment and they're, they tend to be really late game as a result. Consider how crits work currently. Now, currently, crits... that See the 30% critical strike chance on Deathbringer. If I just had Deathbringer increasing my critical strike chance, that doesn't mean 30% of my auto attacks are going to be criticals. That's not what that means. Not anymore. What that means is, in my next 10 auto attacks, I am guaranteed 3 criticals. But the order is randomized. It could be my first three, it could be my last three, it could be any any combination of crits and non-crits in those ten auto attacks. You're thinking to yourself, well, that's cool. And then you're immediately jumping to higher percentages. So yes, if I built a 50% crit strike chance item, that means out of my next ten auto attacks, five of those are guaranteed to be crits, and the order randomizes. The order randomizes every ten auto attacks. If you miss an auto attack that's supposed to be a crit, that's your problem. <laughs> but that is how that works. <clears throat> because it decides when you fire the auto attack, not when it impacts. Just so you know. Now, it's still, uh, you know, if we bring it up to, say, 70%, you're, uh, 7 out of your next 10 auto attacks are guaranteed crits, right? And just rolls and rolls. So the more of these you have, the better. Obviously, exceeding 100% critical strike chance is useless, because it always calculates it by every 10. That's just how the calculation works. But because you typically want two or three crit items, it can take a little while for these to get online. It can take a little while for a crit build to get online, and as a result, these tend to be late game, mid to late game, at the earliest. And if you aren't a hunter that can play well in the early game, depending on what hunter you are, this can be quite crippling, especially in shorter game modes such as Joust, because Joust does tend to run very long because it is only 3v3. So then you're really asking yourself, is this match going to last long enough for that to matter? Right? And that's something you're going... that. Part of that is going to be based on the enemy team composition. The flaw of crit builds that I haven't mentioned yet is because that crit is increasing the auto attack damage by a percentage, if that auto attack was already going to be doing minimal amounts of damage, so will the crit. So typically, critical builds don't do well against tankier compositions like three or four warriors slash guardians, right? So you generally aren't going to build crit builds into tanky comps. It doesn't usually work very well. 
so Neath, with her really powerful abilities that deal really high amounts of damage, she actually weathers a poor early game fairly well because she can utilize her abilities as a damage crutch, so to speak, until the crits come online. But, it, it for Joust very specifically, whether or not crits are viable is going to come down to the team compositions. If I have a more aggressive composition, maybe I don't want crits. Maybe I need to get online a little bit earlier, and crits are just going to take me too long to do that, right? Now, an interesting thing to note, speaking of builds and, you know, the uh, later early game builds, Transcendence is a little bit easier to get away with in Joust, because unlike Arena, where you're typically competing with approximately two mages, it's fairly standard in Arena to have two mages on a team, you're only competing with one. In this case, I'm competing with Hera. Now, interestingly enough, if I saw Hera and I was most other hunters, wouldn't bother building Transcendence. Neath is mage competing, so she can get away with that. But that's because Hera has her Transmogrify shot, which is absurdly long range, and gives her the ability to wipe out waves from an unsavory distance. I don't have to worry about that because, of course, I am Neath. Now, the enemy team composition, I can see they're fairly tanky. Aphrodite is a bit tankier than the usual mage. Daji is a little bit more durable than the average assassin, so I'm not looking to go crits here. It's just not going to work out in the long run. I will be looking to go with a very high power, high penetration build here. I'm kind of leaning towards something along the lines of, say, I'll, I'll, I'll start with Transcendence because I'll want that power. I'm going to go into Hydra's Lament. I'm um, probably going to go into the Crusher for some nice flat penetration. Brawler's Beat Stick for the anti-heal. We're going to go with... Do I want to go with a Death's Toll? No, I think that... I don't think that would be best. I think we're going to go with uh, what I call the Mage Neath. Which is a really interesting build. We definitely need beads for Daji. Uh, basically, this is building Neath really heavily focused on her abilities. And I'm doing this because I do want to emphasize my abilities because it really helps access, you know, accent my anti-healing through Brawler's Beat Stick. So it is something that I'm going to emphasize here. So this is going to be kind of similar to how I built her in Arena, but with some, uh, with a couple of changes. Mostly in the end game items where I'm going to be building Heartseeker instead of, say, Shifter Shield. Because again, with only three enemies, there's not a huge need for protections. I was really hoping for the poke there. But that's okay. But yeah, the first thing we're going to do is Transcendence. Definitely. We want that power spike. Okay, that was good. We might be able to kill her here. Yeah, she's dead. Perfect. Huge, huge early game kill. I don't want to backflip yet. Because I want to see if we can kill Aphrodite. It doesn't look like we're going to be able to, but hold on. She's sticking her eye completely with that. If I had not whiffed that, that might have gone a little bit better. She juked me. I didn't think she was going to go to the right. I thought she was going to go to the left. Uh, I had a 50% chance. It happens. I'm going to want my jump. Oh, they're going for the kill here. Yeah, I'm not too surprised. We still got first blood, though, so we still have the advantage here. Which is really good. They're going for our blue buff. Which we're really not likely to be able to do anything about. I don't think I'm going to be able to catch up to that and take her out. Uh, I did not think he was going that way. I thought he was going to go the other way. It would have made more sense to go across the bridge, to be honest. Hera wasn't going to be there. He took a big risk with that one. Ah, shoot. I missed my shot somehow. I thought she was in range. I guess not. Oh, we'll just clear the wave then. What I should have done is backflipped over there, to be honest. That would have been the smart thing to do. I finally have my ult, which is going to be helpful for dealing with that scenario again. There we go. Exactly. Perfect. Uh, no, I want to stay up for 2,000 gold. I'll help clear this other wave. 
As long as I have my jump, this should be fine. Or my back flip specifically. Alright. Nope. Sorry. I didn't back flip out of that because I wanted to save the mana very specifically. And I didn't want to waste my back flip on an ult that I could just very easily beads out of. I'm going to definitely have enough mana to clear the wave, which is what I need. Because one more wave should be enough to get me to the 2,000 gold I need. Or close enough to it that it's not going to matter. Yeah. There we go. There, I don't know why I wasn't backing earlier, but sure. Can we take out Daji there? It's a damage Daji. Yeah, she's taking the place of the hunter. Okay. So at this point, we're going to try to take things a little slower. I'm building stacks, so I'm going to want to build those, of course. Good. I'll grab that. Yeah, he's building defensive, so... At least he's letting me take the stacks. He, he's paying attention. It's King Arthur. Shout out to the King Arthur. He's very good. He's very aware. I, I keep missing. Her specifically. If he wasn't going to be able to get her, I could have just ulted her. That wasn't going to be a huge deal. At this point, the ult is still very capable of dealing that damage, but it's just not something you're going to use as, oh, they're getting away kind of thing. It's just going to be... At this point, it can still be used for that, but hold on. No. Mostly you use it for that, just like with Arena. Mostly you're using it for that stun. That's a very powerful stun you have there. Backflip on you to slow you down a little bit. This is going to get fairly ugly. You are insistent on killing me. That's fine. As long as she gets you in exchange, that should be okay. She can't because your tankies all get out. But not against that damage type, but anyways. So next is going to be Hydra's Lament. Get our nice, you know, damage spike from that, and then we'll grab the Crusher. Increase our ability damage, get some attack speed in there. Attack speed is still going to be important for us to take out the towers, so even though I'm focusing on my abilities, I still want at least decent attack speed so that I can take out the towers at least in a decent rate of speed. It's still pretty damn important for me to do so as a hunter. It's part of my, you know, it's one of my primary jobs as a hunter in Joust to take out the towers. Or the tower and the phoenix. Especially if the phoenix respawns, I'll, I will also need, be needing to, oh, hello, take that out. I did not immediately realize that I had been grabbed. Nope. Thank you. I gotta get the hell out of here. That almost killed me. He really committed. He didn't need to. He probably should not have. I was backing by the time he even started that commit, but... Okay. Let's see what we can do over here. I hope he's building Andy Heal soon. We're gonna need that. He walked right into that. That was fantastic. I wasted that. Hello. Oh. I'm out of here. Ooh. I'm going to try to bait them under the tower here. Shoot, missed. By a long shot, too. That wasn't even a small miss. Just a really substantial miss. I need these stacks. Please. I can't believe 
Oh, he's right here. Holy cow. He hits hard. Please take him out. Thank you. That's what I needed. Mm, that's a good choice, Book of the Dead. Considering Daji, that's an excellent choice. Am I going to be able to? I might wait a couple of seconds just to grab the Hydra's Lament. It's going to be really important for me to have that so I can turn uh, turn on uh, Daji very quickly if I need to. It's only going to take a couple more seconds. Come on, come on, come on. There we go. Then Crusher next. Again, it's going to help me take those towers. And for when I'm not using abilities, it's going to be increasing my attack speed for that. That was very close. She died to the bleed. No, she did not die to the bleed. Even the game thought she was going to die to the bleed. Kill off of this really quick. That's fine. She'll take that. I'm going to go over here and grab this. Really quick. There we go. Two more stacks, bit of golden experience. All right. My chief concern right now is where is Daji? I'm going to hug this side of the field so that way she doesn't have the ability to teleport to me quite as quickly. I have my backflip up and my beads. There's Daji. So I'm not likely to die she was very late on that very good okay they're committing a little harder to this than I would personally like to see Guess I'll go around and try to help out, but I don't like this position. I can't believe that didn't hit her. Oh well. Gotta go. A second too late. Come on. Ha! Huh. That didn't go the way you thought it would, did it? Let's see if I can bait you into this. Come on. I know you want to attack me. You did not. You resisted temptation? So impressed, you have no idea. I have my, uh, stacks now, though. Can't be too careful. What's all this? Nothing. I'll just grab this for the golden experience. And back. Because at this point, I want the crusher. Myself a nice damage spike. I'm also going to grab an upgrade for my puri. Or my beads, as it's more commonly known. Because I want to at least have, you know, a more likely chance that those are going to be up when she ults. Because it, it, she's already got 30% cooldowns, it's going to get gross. Did not want to deal with Dodgy's nonsense right there. She's probably going to ult soon. She hasn't ulted in a little while. I am missing my ult by just a my ult, my shots by just a little bit. Oop, that's a problem. You're dead. Was 
no way she was getting out of that alive. She has no escape. The King Arthur completely abandoned her. I might be able to take this. Depends on how quickly he went back. Did he back or did he run back? Looks like he ran back if he's not back by this time. I could be wrong though. Nah, I know Daji is coming in for me. If I get cornered by her right now, I'm probably dead, to be honest. She can stick to me well enough that I don't think I would be likely to survive that right now. She is starting to get online with Hudges and then she's got Yodin's Cunning. It, it would not likely end well for me. I'm going to go ahead and let Hera kill these. I don't need the stacks anymore. I don't know why I would bother backing. I don't need to back at this time. I want to make sure that they're not clearing the Bull Demon King. Daji might make the attempt. Nope. She's just right here. This is bad. Okay. Totally saved my life. Absolutely. Whoa. She completely saved my life there. I did... My mistake there was going after the Daji without knowing where all the enemies were. That was my error. I I would have been able to take out the Daji even with her ult, but that King Arthur being there was definitely the point of, oh, I'm in trouble. So that was that differing point there. That was on me for not checking where they were first. 100%. And I should have. That is that is 100%. I sh by rights, I should be dead there. It was only because Hera was paying attention. And obviously asked these questions that I was not asking at the time. That I knew Daji was there because I could hear her, but not know King Arthur was there. Spookiness. Up to 11. I'm backing. I don't want to fight right now. I know we're ahead, but they're fresh. I have money I want to spend. At this particular point in time, we are going to be looking for Brawler's Speed Stick. Again, we do want... I'm also going to increase Aegis as well. And my last item is going to be Heartseeker. Normally, I wouldn't build Heartseeker here uh, on Neath. But given the circumstances where right now my emphasis uh, is on my abilities specifically so I can build, you know, good anti-heal and have, a, you know, a better damage impact as a result of that anti-heal which is tied to my abilities. I could use Toxic Blade, sure, but it's just not as effective in terms of damage output for Neath because her abilities hit so hard. And this is the exact result that you want to see with Mage Neath. I hit her. Nice. Perfect. And that's that's what you want to see with a nice ability-based Neath. And again, this is specifically why I you know went with abilities on Neath. So that way I could good. That way I could lose my ability to speak like a normal human being. That way I could uh, be able to bring substantial damage to bear and still have good anti heal. I'm not sure we survive this fight if we stick around for this, but I've got error coming in. So as long as Daji doesn't get to me, I should be fine. Perfect. And that's game. Absolutely perfect. Now, again... A lot of my build was motivated by two things. In this particular case, it was motivated by the need to bring damage to bear while bringing in some really substantial anti-heal. And I built my anti-heal a little bit late properly. I should have built it as my third item. I'm sorry, my fourth item. I should have swapped where the Crusher and Brawler's Speed Stick were. Um... That's uh, my my brawler's speed stick should have been here as my fourth item. So that was a bit of an issue on my part. We were ahead at that time, so it wasn't a big deal. But if we were behind, that could have absolutely crippled my ability to fight 
Aphrodite, all right? So I only got away with that mistake because we were ahead at that point. So just keep that in mind, that that was more due to the happenstance of us being ahead. I got away with it as a result. Now, something else that I feel is really significant to point out is once I built Transcendence, everything else I was building was going to really quickly spike my power. We have Hydra's Lament, the Crusher, Brawler's Beatstick. My last item is going to be Heartseeker, which is the most expensive item out of all of these, but again, we were ahead. If we were not ahead, I probably would have gone with something a little bit safer. I probably would have gone with Jotun's Wrath if, I, if we were behind, right? Because again, it's something that not a lot of people talk about, whether you're ahead or behind is going to affect what you build. And if you're behind, you want to build cheaper items, so that way you can at least maintain roughly the same power level as your farther ahead enemies. In this case, we were ahead, I would have been able to get away with Heartseeker. With very little issue. And... Another big part of the reason why I built this way was because it does offer me a lot of penetration, a lot of ability to take out towers. You'll notice that I took out the uh, the phoenix very quickly. Nice quick elimination of that phoenix. That was because not only did I have the 10% pen here, I had 15 flat here, 15 flat here, and I would have had another 10% on Heartseeker if I built that, or if I built Jotun's Wrath because I was behind, that would have been a 15 on that instead. You'll notice a lot of penetration happening. Now again, this is very specifically because as a hunter in Joust, it is my job to eliminate those. Now, despite that, if you're able to take the bold Demon King, which is a bit of a gamble, you can get away with Executioner instead, because obviously the Phoenix isn't fighting back, the Tower isn't shooting back, whatever. And under those circumstances, you don't necessarily need quite as much penetration, and you can get away with Executioner if you want to. I prefer, on Neath, in Joust, I prefer the penetration. Because it just generally works better, especially, again, where I'm trying to incorporate Anti-Heal. Because... Once again, while Toxic Blade is nice, it doesn't offer me any power increases, which doesn't help my abilities as Neath. My abilities to scale very high as Neath, which is something I've discussed before. So to kind of accentuate that, I went with ability-based items with penetration. If I was really desperate for penetration, I could have built Titan's Bane, but I often find that that's just more penetration than any human being needs in most cases. If they'd been an abnormally... Like, if they'd been two warriors, or two guardians, yeah, Titan's Bane would have been more on the cards, but that is where I was going very specifically with this build. This is why I built that very specifically. Again, the Crusher was also additionally to increase my attack speed so I could take the tower a bit more fast. That was terrible grammar. A bit faster. And just in general... For Neath, at least, very specifically, this is a great way of approaching this if you do need anti-heal. For a lot of other hunters, and I'll be doing a side-by-side -side comparison later on. Well, I say side-by-side, -side, but it's going to be a different episode. Uh, but what I... For most hunters, they're they're going to build Dominance instead of what I built here. They're going to build... You might still build Hydra's Amend if you're really into it, depending on the hunter. But you're going to be building Dominance. You might build Silver Branch. You're going to be building different penetration items. You wouldn't necessarily be building flat penetration. You'd be building more along the lines of percentage penetration. Like I said, Silver Branch is a common one. Dominance is very popular on Hunters. And that generally can be very, very effective as well. In fact, compared to a lot of other Hunters, Neath is merely mediocre when it comes to taking towers because her emphasis is a bit more on her abilities than a lot of other hunters. Compare, say, to Hachiman, who can increase his attack speed with a war flag. He's much better at taking towers than Neath is because he has that really convenient, immediate attack speed boost. But for Neath, she has to hit enemies with her unravel in order to get that attack speed boost. So if there's no wave coming through the area, she doesn't have an attack speed boost like Hachiman does. So, just as an example... But that's generally where I'm going with this particular build. Again, I call this very specifically Mage Neath. This is a build that I used to use a lot more in the past. Uh, then they updated her Unravel to buff her attack speed whenever you hit an enemy with that. And then I started playing her a bit more towards auto-attacking, but as you can still see, 
again, my English. As you can see, she still is very effective being played as basically a physical mage, and this is part of the reason why when we get to Conquest, I will show you a game of mid lane Neath, is because she can actually play that role very effectively, and I will show that to you. But for Joust at the very least, you really want to emphasize those flat penetrations because you don't have a whole lot of time to get the expensive percentage penetration a lot of the time. You want to just get in there, spike your damage, and deal with them. Now, there are a couple of other ways you can approach Neath here. Obviously, like I said, crits can be very effective, in which case I would have built Gilded Arrow. I still would have gone into Transcendence on Neath, but most other hunters, I build Devourer's Gauntlet. We go into Atlanta's Bow for some crits and some lifesteal, additional lifesteal. And then you waltz right into Deathbringer and add other crits as you feel appropriate. The issue with building crits in Joust very specifically is if you're fond of the item Rage, which gives you increased crit chance per god killer assist up to 5 stacks, that can be a bit tough to stack in Joust because there's only 3 enemies and maybe you die first in the fight and you don't get any kills or assists out of that fight, well in that case assists, and now you're waiting for the next fight and even then it's only going to be 3 stacks at a time, whereas for rage in literally every other mode, particularly arena, it just takes one good team fight where you're getting assists and you've got it fully stacked after one team fight. In fact, rage, and I didn't mention this in arena because I had other things to talk about, but going back to arena as a mode, rage is pretty much a must buy in arena if you're going to build crits in arena. You basically, for a crit build in arena, you go gilded arrow, you go with Devourer's Gauntlet, if you're mage competing, you build Rage. You build Deathbringer, and then you build whatever last two items if you like to, and that's pretty much once you evolve your Gilded Arrow into the Ornate Arrow, you're pretty much all set in terms of crit chance. But Rage is a requirement for Arena, partially because it's very easy to stack in, ar in Arena, all those team fights right from the get-go, very easy to stack. Secondly, it's... The item, it's the one item in the game that gives you the absolute highest amount of crit chance. Fully stacked, I believe it's at 45%. 45 or 50%. It's pretty substantial. And the Ornate Arrow evolution of Gilded Arrow, I believe, gives you 25%. And then, of course, you've got the 30 off of Deathbringer. But you can build that in Arena without slowing yourself down by too much. Really, the big question there is, can you stack Devourer's Gauntlet in time, right? If you can't, build Bloodforge, build Aussie, something. Atlantis Bow, if you're really feeling it, but honestly, at that point, you really don't. If you're going to be building Rage later, you really don't. But just as kind of a conversational piece there for crits, you can do that in Arena as well. It just is, again, you, you're really gambling on making it to that late game when Arena and Joust are not well known for late games. I mean, look at this match. This match took, what, 20 minutes, I think? I think it was just a 20-minute match. Uh, 16 minutes. This is a 16-minute match. Okay, that's even shorter than the average arena. Arenas usually take between 20 and 25 minutes. Even on slow arenas, it's between 20 and 25 minutes. This is a very fast joust, and that's not that unusual. Okay. Again, we didn't even... No one finished their build here. And that's fairly common in Joust. So, if you are going to be building crits in Joust, be very careful, because Rage is harder to stack in Joust than in any other game mode. And just the difficulty here of getting yourself to that late game where the crits are going to come online, that can be very tough if you're the wrong hunter, or if the team comps are wrong, right? So just... Treat crits very carefully with Arena and Joust very specifically, because it can backfire very badly. But that is why I built Neath this way. Again, this isn't normally how I build Hunters in general. This is something I do with very select Hunters. Neath, Chiron. Um, this is something you can... Uh, Chiron's even better with that build than Neath is, to be honest. Uh, there are a couple of other Hunters that I would build that way. Medusa... Uh, comes right off the top of my head. I know people like to play Uller like that. I 
it's not a, my personal preference in playing him, but it is good on him. It's just not how I like to play him. People will tell you building like that is good on Amazon Cobb. Don't believe them. Yes, there are some people who can pull that off, but they practice quite a while with that. There's better ways of playing him. We'll talk about him in the future. Uh, Ishtar is really good building what I call the mage style, the physical mage style. Those are the ones that come to me off the top of my head. Yeah, those are the ones. Medusa, Neath, Ishtar. Those are the ones that I build mage on. I'll build physical mage on. Is those Enchiron. Uh, one, two, three, four, four. They're great with that. But with that being said, that is Joust. Uh, and things you want to think about in Joust. Um, now, the, the nice thing about Joust is one final note on Joust before I end the episode. In Arena, I was really keeping an eye on the enemy front line who would be initiating onto me and, in theory, locking me down to get me killed. The nice thing about Joust as a hunter is that I only have to really pay attention to really two people. This particular Joust match with the Daji and the King Arthur was actually a bit unusual because I did have to keep an eye out both for the Daji and for the King Arthur. Because the Daji is an assassin, despite the fact that she was replacing the hunter, because of the way assassins play, she needed to initiate as well when she thought she could get a kill. So I actually had to watch two specific enemies, because you'll also notice that Aphrodite really never initiated. She reacted. Like I did a lot of the times. I often reacted to the enemy initiating. Right? If I saw Daji was teleporting to me, I backflipped. Right? That kind of thing. Most jousts, you only have to pay attention to one enemy waiting for the initiation. Usually, there's one designated enemy on the enemy team, their tank, whoever their frontliner is. That's their initiator. That's the one you really have to watch in most cases. Like I said, this was an unusual match in that I had to watch two enemies. But the same principle applies. And just know that for most joust matches, that's unusual. Most of them, there's only the one initiator. It's just, it makes it a little bit easier for you to practice laning, because you only do have to watch the one enemy for initiation. Um, but yeah, we've talked about towers, we've talked about crits, we've talked about penetration, we've talked about the issues of building crits and later game builds, or expensive builds in Arena and in Joust. So, great coverage, and next time we'll be talking about slash and i'll be talking more generally about gameplay as a hunter in general because there's nothing particularly special in slash to talk about besides the juggernauts which i will be talking about of course in that episode but i'll be talking about the juggernauts in that episode of course and from there we'll move on to conquest and how you play conquest as a hunter and what kinds of things you want to be thinking about then so with that being said, thank you all very much for joining me. If you liked this, please like and subscribe. If you didn't, please ignore me. And if you have any comments, questions, concerns, ideas, suggestions, or requests, please leave them down in the comment section below. And thank you all very much for joining me, and have a great 24 hours.